and go. Happy Tuesday to you. I greet you in the name of the Lord. This is Pastor Altina McCree from Oakland, California. Let's talk and sharing and caring global ministries. We praise God for another opportunity to come before you and to share what the Lord would say at this time. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. My soul in sad exile was out on life's sea, so burdened with sin and distressed. Then I heard a sweet voice saying, make me your choice. And I entered the haven of rest. I yielded myself to his tender embrace, faith taking hold of his word. My fetters fell off. My fetters fell off and I anchored my soul. The haven of rest is my Lord. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest and I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep. In Jesus, I'm safe evermore. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep, but in Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Father, in Jesus' name, now we enter into your gates with thanksgiving and we enter into your courts with praise. Truly, you have been good, you have been loving, and you have been kind to us. And there is no one like you. We lean on you today. We rest ourselves. Our, we lean on your breast today. And we ask you, Lord, to be our portion. Lord, be with us today. Lord, we don't know what this week is going to entail, but we know that because you live, we can face every tomorrow. We know, Lord, that because you resurrected on the third day with all power in your hands, that we have all power in our hands. Let us use that power for your glory and for your honor. Now, Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this time of sharing. Look upon all of those that are ailing today, that are sick and shut in, that are receiving this COVID all over again. Lord, we pray that you would stretch out your hand right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Our scripture reading for today is going to come from Psalms 37 and reading from the New International Version. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the Lord and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord and trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because it only leads to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked for he knows their day is coming. The wicked draw up the sword and bend the bow to break down the poor and needy, to slay those whose ways are upright. But their swords will stab their own hearts 
and their bowels will be broken. It is better to be godly and have little than to be evil and rich. For the strength of the wicked will be shattered, but the Lord takes care of the ungodly. Day by day, the Lord takes care of the innocent and they will receive an inheritance that lasts forever. They will not be disgraced in hard times. Even in famine, they will have more than enough. But the wicked will die. The Lord's enemies are like flowers in a field. They will disappear like smoke. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall. And though they stumble, they will never fall. Once I was young and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. Turn from evil and do good and you will live in the land forever. For the Lord loves justice and he will never abandon the upright. He will keep them safe forever, but the children of the wicked will die. The godly will possess the land and will live there forever. Put your hope in the Lord. Travel steadily along his path. He will honor you by giving you the land and you will see the wicked destroyed. I have seen wicked and ruthless people flourishing like a tree in its native soil. But when I looked again, they were gone. Though I searched for them, I could not find them. Look at those who are honest and good. For a wonderful future awaits those who love peace. But the rebellious will be destroyed. They absolutely have no future. The Lord rescues the godly. He is their fortress in times of trouble. The Lord helps them, rescuing them from the wicked. He saves them and they find shelter in him. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. On today, I'm glad to have my uh, producer back with me, um, Mr. Jeff Gatsby Wilson, who is still in the process of making final arrangements for his beloved sister's funeral in New York City on this coming Friday. Had I known that that had not happened yet, I would not have even allowed him to take time out of his schedule to accommodate me on today. But let's remember uh, my producer, Mr. Jeff Gatsby Wilson and his entire family as they go through the grieving process and are able to lay Amanda Wilson to rest. Now, I just want to say something about last Saturday and the homegoing services for our beloved elder Richard Kimbrell. Those services were held at the Church in the Round, First Church of God in Christ in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. And elder Richard Kimbrell, Kimbrell was the pastor of Fellowship Church of God in Christ in Ohio. That was an absolutely wonderful service. I don't know when I have experienced a service like that. And I tell you, I got saved all over again on Saturday. It's a wonder they didn't call 911 because I was in here jumping and dancing and screaming and shouting, thanking God for the heritage and the legacy that we all received at the First Church of God in Christ, 745 Griffith Street in Aliquippa. Pennsylvania and different ones got up to speak. His children were absolutely wonderful. And his brother Tellus just uh, sent us dancing. He preached uh, his own eulogy for his beloved brother. When Bishop Bernard Wallace got up, who was a best friend of Elder Richard Kimbrell and both of them grew up in church and began to reminisce and talk about how 
those old saints, Elder Kimbrell's grandmother, Mother Clara Kimbrell, and that entire Kimbrell family, Church of God in Christ dynasty. He also talked about his grandmother, Mother Lillian Balknight, another dynasty, the Balknights, Iversons, Wallaces, um, Church of God in Christ, all the way from the beginning until now. And of course, Bishop Bernard Wallace is now a cogent bishop. But in talking about the fact that we were all baptized in the Ohio River in South Heights, Pennsylvania, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was baptized by of the CT tombs on July the 25th, 1957. And after the service, uh, First Lady Vivian Carter Blackshear and I, and Evangelist Elfrida Slayton, who is first cousin to Elder Kimbrell, we talked about the rich heritage and the rich legacy of those two men. Elder C.T. Toombs and Bishop Melvin Eugene Clark. I tell you, you had to be there and to come through those ministries to understand what it was like and to understand how we will forever treasure it and how our deep holy roots are embedded in history and embedded in those times that we shared. I often say that we talk about the fact that we sat up and looked at that banner every time we came into First Church of God in Christ and that banner said, Jesus never fails. I tell you, I thought that Dr. Joyce Slide was going to take wings and fly right here to Oakland as excited as she was, as I was able to share the services with her. And again, she was able to experience and remember and recall our roots at First Church of God in Christ and with her parents, Trustee Wingate and Mother Carrie Wingate and those Williams and all of those that were intertwined in there that were all families, but that were all serving the Lord to the best of our ability at First Church. And so First Lady Juanita Kimbrough, we send our prayers and condolences to you. You have remained for all of these years a soulmate and a team player to Elder Richard Kimbrough. Need and I shared the same position when we were working at Allegheny Airlines in Green Tree, Pennsylvania. Neat, we love you and we will continue to keep you in our prayers. So now we have been talking, last week was the first Tuesday in August and I had said that August would be the month of monumental miracles. And I pray that you have taken that into your heart and into your mind and into your spirit and that you are expecting God to perform monumental miracles for you this very month. Song says something good is going to happen to you this very hour and this very day. Something good is going to happen to you because Jesus of Nazareth is passing your way. And so last week we talked about the monumental miracle that happened when there was a famine in Samaria. And so I want to go back there for a minute and just cover a little bit of that that I failed to put closure to. That was the fact that the lepers, the four lepers, were the men that went to the city and shared with them the miracle. Now, 
I'm sure that you know that lepers were unclean. They were not able to be with people. They were not able to even be with their family. Once it was discovered that they had leprosy, they were sent to a leper's camp. And if you came near them, if they happened to be on the street, they had to cry out, unclean, unclean, to warn you not to come near them. But it was these four lepers that took it upon themselves to say, if we stay here in the famine, we'll die. So let us go over here to the camp and see if they will give us some food. If they say no, we know that we're going to die anyway. We have a death sentence over our head. And so it is that story that those lepers tiptoed into the camp and began to go in each tent and find that there was food left cooking on the stove and that there was jewels and raiment and all kinds of things that were left. And they began to take them until they thought, but the city, a city that would have been mean to them, would have cast them out. But they said, we need to go and give this word. We need to go to the city and let them know that there is all of this right outside of the gates and down the way a little bit. And so we thank God that they had the ability and the knowledge to render themselves and to be a blessing. We talked last week about a monumental miracle coming to you, but we also talked about you becoming a monumental miracle to others. And so right now I want to go to the scripture that we're going to talk about today. I want to encourage you in this scripture, another monument to miracle that took place. You all know how I love to read Kings and I love to talk about the exploits of Elijah and Elisha. And so let's just go here and read these few verses. One day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried, my husband who served you is dead and you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come threatening to take my sons as slaves. This is Second Kings, the fourth chapter. Elisha said, what can I do to help you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? The widow said, nothing at all, except a flask of olive oil. And Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors, and then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it is filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her and she filled one after another. Soon every container was filled to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on the leftovers. Now we want to say that the widow didn't have 
much, but she had something that she could use. She had something that she could present to the Lord that he could multiply. Well, doesn't that remind us of in the New Testament when the 5,000 men plus women and children had been to listen to Jesus' sermon and now it was the end of the day. All the restaurants and stores were closed and the disciples said, these people need to go away because there's no way that we can feed them. And we know the story that the little boy came with his lunch, two fish and five loaves of bread. And because he had something to bring, something to offer, Jesus was able to bless it and break it. And it was multiplied and it fed 5,000 men plus women and children. And they had some left over. So this widow, all she had was a flask of olive oil. And the man of God told her, have your sons go and borrow containers from your friends and neighbors. Borrow containers from the community and bring them. Shut the door of your house. You and your sons go in and shut the door because God is going to do a monumental miracle. Now, the thing is, they could have had even more than they had, but they only got so many vessels. And so today, we want to think about the fact that when our faith is not where it should be, then we don't believe God for the monumental miracle. We just believe him for a miracle. But I tell you, I have been assigned to say a monumental miracle. I want to go back again and say what my beloved late pastor, Bishop Walter L. Hawkins said just a few weeks before he went home to glory. He said that the Lord said to him, Walt, you ask me prayers that embarrass me. And he said, Lord, what, what do you mean? And he said, the Lord said to him, because you ask me prayers that if I don't answer it, you can hustle up and get it yourself. He said, I'm a big God. Ask largely of me because I own all of the silver and the gold. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to me. I'm the one that said, let there be, and there was. I am that I am. And so today I want to encourage you and inspire you to believe God for monumental miracles. We said a monumental miracle is something that is unexpected, something that really you can't even contain. You can't even hold it because it is so vast. That reminds me of the scripture that talks about the fact that when God had blessed Abraham and Lot, it said that they had so much substance that the land could not hold them, that one had to go one way and one had to go another way. And so we thank God for monumental miracles. When a miracle comes to you, it might come from the most unlikely source from the most unlikely person. And this is why we have to be careful how we treat people because the same people that you met going up are the same people that you'll meet coming down. 
Bishop Michael Pitts says that you have to be careful because the people that you're trying to get with, the people that you're saying, ooh, if I could just get with them, ooh, if I could just be their friend, ooh, if I could just get in their circle, those are the people that are getting ready to descend. And the people that you're looking down on and don't want to be bothered with, those are the people that are getting ready to ascend. So you have to be careful how you treat people. I want to tell you a little story in talking about not knowing who is going to bring you a miracle. In talking about how the lepers, the most unlikely, the unclean four men were the ones that couldn't go in the city, but they could go to the gate and tell the gatekeeper what had happened. A few years ago, this is my sister's testimony, Pastor Avril Vereen, the founder and senior pastor emeritus of Holy Spirit Fellowship Churches in Beaver Falls and in New Brighton, Pennsylvania. She said that one Saturday evening, the church was selling dinners. They were having the antique car show and Holy Spirit Fellowship, they love, they have some wonderful cooks and they love to have booths and sell meals. And so they were out in front of her church in Beaver Falls selling food. She said that she had gone back and she had on this uh, trench coat and she said that she had gone back and decided to rest and sat on one of the steps of the church. She said that a gentleman came up to her kind of unsightly, looked like literally he kind of could have been homeless. And he said to her, ma'am, would you like to have a church? And she said, I have a church. This is my church right here. He scribbled an address on a torn piece of paper and handed it her to her and said, well, if you'd like to have another church, go to this address. He was an unlikely messenger an unlikely heralder. She took the piece of paper and put it in her coat pocket. And she said some days later, she put that coat on again and reached in her pocket and found that sliver of paper there. And she said, she looked at the address and she said, well, let me just go by here. Let me, let me just have somebody drive me by here to see what it is at this address. And lo and behold, it was this cathedral. It was this absolute beautiful brick building, almost twice the size of her church in Beaver Falls. If you ever watch her on Facebook Live on Fridays at 8.30 our time in California, 11.30 Eastern Standard Time, you will see her standing in that edifice with all of those beautiful pipes to that pipe organ. She contacted the folk. I don't know how that part happened, but she was able to buy that church for little of nothing, for pennies on the dollar. If I'm not mistaken, she was able to pay cash for it. And the church probably appraises for a million dollars now. Beautiful stained glass windows, beautiful restrooms and stained glass windows, even in the restrooms, beautiful reception areas. So much so that they haven't even been able in all of these years to yet do all of the rooms, to decorate all of the rooms a gymnasium and a kitchen par excellence. 
They left all of the crockery, all of the commercial pots and pans, all of the silverware and the dishes and glasses, commercial dishwasher. That church is so beautiful till when I go home, I tell her, I don't even want to stay at your house. I just want to sleep down here in this church. It is so beautiful. And then somebody called her and said, Pastor Green, we want to give you a baby grand piano. And that's in there. But it goes to show you, don't look down on the messenger because you don't know what good thing is in store for you. And so when I speak about us individuals becoming a monumental miracle to someone, to a household, to a neighborhood, to a community. I want to say to you today that all of us have ministry in us. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be an evangelist. You don't have to be a prophet to extend yourself to someone, to some family, to some neighbor. Just your life experiences. Yes, we as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we present the word of God whenever and however we can. But you don't even have to know everything about the word of God. You may only know the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You may only know the Lord's prayer and a few other scriptures that you have come about in your lifetime. But you still...
And so we're moving forward to what we were saying. I'm saying that when we look at people and see their position, we look at them and feel like they have it all together. But let's just look at this situation that happened last week. It has, I've not been able to shake it. And I've talked with others that say they feel the same way. Last Thursday, around two o'clock in the afternoon, an absolutely beautiful black woman, a nurse by profession, caused an horrific accident in Los Angeles. When I heard where it happened, I know that area well. And it is stated that this nurse was inebriated and ran through a red light at the speed of 100 miles an hour. When she hit those cars, an explosion went off and six innocent people were killed. Another eight were taken to the hospital. I know of someone that lives in the area that said they thought that a bomb had hit. That was the magnitude of the explosion. If someone could have observed that this nurse was having these problems, perhaps at work, they were able to see inequities in her demeanor, possibly able to maybe even smell alcohol on her breath, as opposed to individuals on jobs and in the workplace who say, well, I didn't wanna, I didn't, I didn't wanna have anybody feel upset with me. I didn't wanna offend anybody. So I sat back and I didn't say anything. A short story was that my UPS driver, Roshan Mungo, my beloved Roshan Mungo, came just about every other day to bring me a box of some type of clothing to the store. He was my UPS driver for 17 years, was also my driver when I was just doing travel. And Roshan would come into the store reeking of alcohol. Day after day, that alcohol had grasped him and wouldn't let him go. I approached him about it and found out that Rashawn's mother was a Pentecostal preacher. And there were just things in his life that he had not been able to put closure to that was causing him to drink. He had received many warnings at work because other UPS drivers would come in on his off day and share with me about it. And of course, the thing was that he was such a great employee that they just no way would let him go. Rashawn contracted cancer and was off from work for a while. We prayed without ceasing for him and one day he was back at work and the cancer was in remission. Of course, he wasn't drinking anymore. They had told him that he couldn't drink anymore and he wasn't 
He never, I never smelled alcohol on his breath anymore. And he continued to come in and I continued to minister to him. Well, I want you to know that the cancer returned and Rashawn accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior, was baptized with the Holy Ghost and is in over in glory waiting for me to arrive. So don't be ashamed of what you need to share with others. I talk about many times how one of the attorneys that handled the O.J. Simpson case and his son drowned in their swimming pool. And he got on the news and talked about how you all, the world looks at us and you think we're famous and we're popular and you look at where we live and you look at the car we drive and you look at our profession. But he said, my child had been on drugs since he was 12 years old. And so we look at the homeless and the disenfranchised and all of those people and we are praying for them and we are extending our hands to them. But the people that are in the limelight, that are in the spotlight, that their names are up in lights, most of them are in some kind of trouble. Their children, their grandchildren, their siblings, they're in some kind of trouble. And so what we want to do, each and every one of you, and you might say, well, Pastor Altina repeated herself a lot today. I do that because as you know, this ministry, we are on all of these different media networks, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook Watch, Facebook Live, and my producers, networks, we're on all of them. And as you know, I constantly am putting our weekly presentations back on. Sometimes in the middle of the night, it's on. Because I want to reach everyone, not just the people that are on every week. And I so appreciate all of you that are so faithful to me. But I want to reach the unreachable. I want people to be riveted at their core, understanding what time it is, understanding where we are, understanding all of the grief and crime and violence that we are experiencing all over the nation, all over the world. And so it is important. Sometimes I see guys on here that were born and raised in Aliquippa. I know what church you went to, Tridestone, you went to Bethel, you went to Ebenezer, and we're all in the fourth quarter of our lives. I don't know what your relationship is now with church or with the Lord, but I encourage you and beg you to Take time and sit down and reflect and remember how you were raised, how you went to Sunday school every Sunday and YPWW and those kinds of things. Remember that and remember that you need to make a rededication, a recommitment to Jesus Christ. You need to take that that you know, those crumbs, you may not remember it all, but the crumbs of what you remember and share it wherever you can. It might be at the gas station. It might be at the laundromat. It might be at the car wash. 
but whenever and wherever you can share a message of hope, do that. On Sunday, as I was leaving church, the usher that ushers on my aisle, I said to her, have a good week. And she said, thank you. And I said, I don't know your name. She gave me her name and she said, and I need prayer. Some people would think, well, the usher, she's ushering at church. What could she need prayer about? And I stood there, looked at her and shared with her what she needed to hear. She dropped her mouth open and stepped back and bucked her eyes and looked at me. She says, you know nothing about me. I says, no, I don't, but God does. I remember going to Bishop Macklin's Glad Tidings. My dear 50-year friend went to his church service one Sunday. And the Lord had me to just fasten my eyes on this lady. I watched her during the service. I watched her walk around and give her offering and walk out the door. I got up and immediately, as quickly as I could, walked out behind her and grabbed her and said, sweetheart, I just wanna give you a hug. The woman burst into tears and came into my arms sobbing, said, I came to church like this and I was going home the same way until you have shown me this love, until you have embraced me. Now I can go home feeling different. It's important that we become monumental miracles to people. Let's not just look for a monumental miracle to come to us, but let's ask the Lord to give us discernment and perception, to give us a heart for ministry, to give us a heart to speak love, joy, peace and hope to people. When I think about that nurse, her life is literally over. And whatever was driving her, was sending her at that rate of speed, whatever demons were talking to her, just think about it. She will never be able to have her profession again, but just think about it. Six innocent lives are gone. You're just there waiting at the red light, thinking that you're on your way wherever. And here you have ended up in eternity. The song says you may build a cathedral great and Small, you may build a skyscraper, large and tall. You may conquer all the failures of your past, but only what you do for Christ will last. And so in my closing today, the last scripture I want to read is Philippians 4 and 9. And in the New Living Translation, it says, keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, do that. And then the God of peace will be with you. And so what I'm saying today is all that we know and have seen and have heard in however many years we have lived, let's use that now. Let's take whatever that crumb is, whatever that small amount is. And let's say to the Lord, I come to you as the little boy came with the two fish and five loaves of bread. Use me, use my gift, multiply it and let it meet the needs of me. I want to say to you today, as I seldom say, I encourage you to plant a seed into this ministry 
sharing and caring global ministries. I'm not just sitting here in one place doing this on Tuesday, but I am constantly doing what I can for the many people that call me homeless ministry, other people that have not received their checks that need help. So many things that we are doing on a daily basis. And this ministry is a wonderful place to plant your seed. I thank you all that do plant seed with me. But so many of you don't go to any church. You're not giving any money to the Lord's work. I encourage you to zell me or cash at me and your seed will be used for good. Let's seal this now with a closing prayer. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Lord, we thank you now for this day. We thank you for this time of sharing. Father, I pray that you would seal this that has been spoken today. But Father, I pray that you would allow this word to take root and to grow in many that have heard it today or whenever they shall hear it. To know, Lord, that you have assigned each and every one of us to be our brother's keeper, to be our sister's keeper. Lord, we ask you today to use us for your glory. We come humbly and empty, saying, asking you to fill us to overflowing. And then let us take that that you have given to us and extend it to others. Father, I pray today for my nephew, Pastor Oshia Vreen, that you would touch his body from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Whatever that virus is, that you would run it out and strengthen him, give him strength and stamina. He is one that watches me all the time. Let him know that we are praying for him on today. All of those that have given and tended prayer requests, the Givens girls that are battling COVID, all of those, Janine that is battling breast cancer, and so many that are calling in for prayer. Basil Smith, our beloved. Father, we pray that you would extend your hand of mercy at that hospital in Las Vegas. Touch Fetty, touch Marion, and touch Kimmy and Jason. My God, children, strengthen them, Lord, and give them grace during this time. We pray again for Mr. Jeff Gatsby Wilson and his entire family, that you would be with them, that you would comfort them, meet every need that they have. And Lord, we just give you the glory and the honor and the praise. We thank you and we love you. And I thank you for hearing my prayer now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And until next week or whenever you see or hear this, we bless you in the name of the Lord. I love you. Please keep me in your prayers. God bless.